Good evening and welcome to Westminster Abbey in the heart of London for tonight's concert live on BBC Two and Radio Three as a part of our celebration of the tercentenary of one of our greatest composers, Henry Purcell. Westminster Abbey, where Purcell was organist, is a building steeped in history. It's been the coronation place and the burial ground of our kings and queens since the days of Edward the Confessor in the 11th century. 300 years ago on this very day, the 5th of March, 1695, Purcell's patron, Queen Mary, was buried here with great ceremony. In the floor, a modest tablet commemorates her memory. Tonight we'll hear, for the first time in 300 years, all the music that was heard on that occasion. And we'll place that alongside the rich and varied celebratory music which Purcell wrote for this remarkable queen. William III and Mary II were, uniquely in our history, crowned as equal king and queen here in the Abbey in 1689. Our concert opens with a magnificent short anthem by Purcell heard on that occasion. The entrance processional text, I was glad when they said unto me, we will go into the house of the Lord. Within a few minutes, this marvellous piece concentrates all Purcell's genius, from the sudden yearning intensity of O oh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, to the display of virtuosity at World Without End, Amen. Tonight's concert is conducted by the present organist at Westminster Abbey and one of Purcell's successors, Martin Neary. <clears throat> and here he is to conduct the choir of Westminster Abbey in Purcell's I Was Glad.
I was glad when they said unto me, sung at the coronation of William and Mary here in the Abbey in 1689. That anthem had been written four years earlier for the coronation of Mary's father, James II, who proved a far from popular monarch. Mary, by contrast, immediately won the love and affection of her people. Her coronation didn't pass without incident for Purcell. Apparently, he sold places in his organ loft for the ceremony. His case was then considered by the 17th century equivalent of a sleaze inquiry, and he was forced to repay the money he'd made to the Abbey treasurer. Well, Purcell survived that incident, perhaps because of his undoubted musical mastery. For William and Mary's coronation, he composed the fine accompanied anthem, Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem, written to follow the actual moment of crowning. The choir of Westminster Abbey is joined by the new London consort and conducted by Martin Neary.
Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem, by Henry Purcell. Music for the coronation of William and Mary, sung by the choir of Westminster Abbey, conducted by Martin Neary. Exactly 300 years ago, Queen Mary was buried here in Westminster Abbey. Who was this young monarch for whom Purcell wrote some of his finest music? During her short reign, she was very popular, more popular than the rather dour and serious king. Here's the diarist John Evelyn reporting on her arrival at the Palace of Whitehall in 1688, the year of the Glorious Revolution. She came into Whitehall laughing and jolly as to a wedding, so as to seem quite transported. She rose early the next morning and, in her undress, as it was reported, before her women were up, went about from room to room to see the convenience of Whitehall, lay in the same bed and apartment where the late Queen lay, and, within a night or two, sat down to play at Bassett, as the Queen, her predecessor, used to do. She smiled upon and talked to everybody, so that no change seemed to have taken place at court since her last going away. But for all her youth and energy, Mary was above all a devout and pious woman. Her memoirs record her rather shocked reaction on her return to England to the easygoing manners of Restoration London. 
The first thing that surprised me at my coming over was to see so little devotion in a people so lately in such eminent danger. I found a great change come into my life. From a strict retirement where I led the life of a nun, I was come into a noisy world full of vanity. From hearing public prayers four times a day to have hardly leisure to go twice. I did resolve to do what I could towards making devotion looked on as it ought and would fain have it more serious. Mary took on an intense interest in the affairs of the church, issuing proclamations to a more godly life and urging a proper observation of the Sabbath. Religion was her main comfort, particularly during those lonely, anxious summers when William was away at war. The king is no sooner returned than there is only talk of his going away again, so that there is scarcely time to get over a horrid summer before one is dreading a sad spring. Well, court composers weren't blind to their queen's predicament, and a number of short, intimate works bear telling witness to the affection she inspired. We're going to hear now two songs for Queen Mary, both written by organists of the Abbey, and both alluding to the extensive military campaigns which William III undertook. First, one by Purcell's teacher, John Blow, who was Abbey organist until he resigned in favour of the young Purcell in 1679. The sullen years are past looks forward to the peace and security that William and Mary will bring following the turmoil of war. That's sung by Ian Bostridge. And then Emma Kirkby sings Purcell's song, Stripped of Their Green. In contrast to some of the inferior poetry Purcell had to deal with, this is a fine poem. The lover welcomes winter, even though it's cold and freezing, because her swain can be at home with her rather than away at war. And here now are Ian Bostrich and Emma Kirkby.
songs for Queen Mary. The Sullen Years Are Past by John Blow and Stripped of Their Green by Purcell. Sung by Ian Bostrich and Emma Kirkby. Queen Mary's great passions in life were architecture and gardening. She worked closely with Sir Christopher Wren, not only on early plans for the Royal Hospital at Greenwich, but also on the building of royal palaces at Kensington and in particular at Hampton Court. The Great Tudor Palace at Hampton Court was the site of one of Mary's most important building projects. It was here that Sir Christopher Wren was commissioned to design and build a series of magnificent new apartments for King William and Queen Mary, with windows which would give unrivalled views over the newly created Baroque gardens. Simon Thurley is the curator of Britain's historic royal palaces. Mary was incredibly interested in the minutiae of architecture and the gardens that she was building. And many a time she'd get on the barge from Whitehall, come down the River Thames, get off at the Tudor Watergate and discuss the plans in detail, more or less over her dining table with Sir Christopher Wren, with a pair of dividers, working out precisely where her rooms would be, where her husband's rooms would be and how they'd be decorated when they were finally completed. As building work at Hampton Court and Kensington started, Mary was determined to see the projects completed as soon as possible. She was anxious that William, who was asthmatic, could move out of polluted Westminster into cleaner country air. Mary urged on the workmen at both of the palaces. And the speed which she urged them on in the end led to disaster, because both at Hampton Court and at Kensington, the buildings collapsed halfway through the construction. At last it pleased God to show me the uncertainty of all things below. For part of the house which was new built fell down. All this as much as it was the fault of the workmen, humanly speaking, yet showed me the hand of God plainly in it, and I was truly humbled. Humbled but undaunted in her ambition, Mary continued working enthusiastically on her plans for the new gardens and overseeing the building site at the palace right up to the last months of 1694. But then disaster struck. The young Queen Mary, only 32, died of smallpox. William was devastated and work on Hampton Court ground to a halt. It had been Mary who'd forced on the work at Hampton Court and tragically she was never to live to see her great memorial completed. Well, perhaps the greatest memorial to Queen Mary is the music Purcell wrote for her. Each April, he composed an elaborate birthday ode. The first birthday of her reign fell only a few weeks after her coronation, so Purcell presumably worked fast to write the marvellous ode we're going to hear in a moment. Now does the glorious day appear, is richly scored, and the opening and closing choruses have a splendour we associate with the music of Handel. So, to perform the 1689 birthday ode for Queen Mary, now does the glorious day appear, here are the soloists Emma Kirkby, Ian Bostrich, Michael Chance, Stephen Richardson and Simon Birchall. The choir of Westminster Abbey and the new London consort are conducted by Martin Neary.
Not anyone such joy could bring. Not anyone such joy could bring. No, no, not that which rushes in, which rushes in the spring. No, no, not that which rushes in the spring. Not anyone such joy. Not anyone, such joy could bring. No, no, not which rushes in, which rushes in the spring. No, no, not that which rushes in the spring. That all ensuing plenty, that all ensuing plenty hopes does give. this place. 
same path which did frail humankind create, and they were lost them to restore. It was a work of full as great a weight, and did require the self same power which did frail humankind create when they were lost them to Mixed with 
now does the glorious day appear. The 1689 birthday ode for Queen Mary by Henry Purcell. The soloists were Emma Kirkby, Michael Chance, Ian Bostrich, Stephen Richardson and Simon Birchall, with the choir of Westminster Abbey and the New London Consort by Martin Neary. Martin Neary taking a bow as conductor there and indicating the soloists and the choir of Westminster Abbey. Wonderful there how Purcell writes those two contrasting ground basses, repeated sequences of bass notes over the which the soloists sing their florid inventions. The soloists taking another bow here, and Martin Neary, bringing the choir of Westminster Abbey to its feet, and the new London consort. And a final chorus there that indeed sets the heavens ringing. Well, after the short interval in tonight's concert, we're going to hear for the first time all the music performed at Queen Mary's funeral here 300 years ago on the 5th of March, 1695. But first, let's take a closer look at what death and mortality meant at this time. We'll hear first from the historian, Roy Porter. And so Mary was given an enormous, elaborate state funeral. A vast procession carried the hearse to Westminster Abbey, accompanied by three new funeral marches. For the splendid ceremony inside the Abbey, we'd always thought that the choir sang Purcell's famous early settings of the funeral sentences but we now know that only one of these was actually written for Queen Mary's funeral. Thou Knowest Lord is a short, noble piece in a consciously antique style. But, as Purcell scholar Bruce Wood noticed, on its own it's hardly enough to grace such an important state occasion. The other curious thing is that the one piece we do have, Thou Knowest Lord, The Secrets of Our Hearts, is not a freestanding portion of the text of the funeral service as it's given in the Book of Common Prayer. Purcell, I realized, must have intended it to go with some other music. And I decided to investigate all the settings of the complete funeral service that existed before Purcell's lifetime. Eventually, I found a setting by a very great Tudor musician, Thomas Morley, which was routinely sung, according to the evidence, at state funerals in Westminster Abbey. And when I examined 17th century sources of it, I found that his setting of Thou Knowest Lord had been lost, probably during the Civil War. Having got that far, I decided I'd better investigate all the manuscripts that survive of the Morley, not just the ones from the 17th century that lack Thou Knowest Lord. And to my delight, here in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, I found a manuscript which is headed The Funeral Service by Dr. Morley, but which proves to contain Purcell's setting running straight out of the previous music by Morley and straight into it again. And Purcell composed his setting in exactly the same sort of style to plug the gap. Welcome back to Westminster Abbey for the second part of this live concert on BBC Two and Radio Three to celebrate the Purcell Tercentenary. Although Queen Mary had died just after Christmas in 1694, a combination of dreadful icy weather and the continuing smallpox epidemic prevented the lying in state from starting till the following February. On March the 5th, still in bitter winter weather, the immense funeral procession made its way down Whitehall and arrived at the doors of this building. A marching band of oboes and drums accompanied the procession and we'll hear one of their marches by Thomas Tollett, played in the cloister here at the Abbey. 
The diarist, John Evelyn, then describes the funeral procession. And we move inside the Abbey for the second march, which is by John Paisible. After this, we hear an elegy which Purcell wrote in response to Queen Mary's death. O Divi Custos, O sacred guardian of the House of Orange, Mary is dead, lament now, O ye muses. I went to see the ceremony. Never was so universal a mourning. All the Parliament men had cloaks given them, and 400 poor women. All the streets hung, and the middle of the street boarded and covered with black cloth.
Emma Kirtley and Evelyn Tubb sang O Divi Custos, the intimate private aspect of mourning for Queen Mary. Now the music actually heard during Queen Mary's burial service here in the Abbey. We'll also hear an eyewitness account of the ceremony. First, Purcell's March, written for flat trumpets, rarely used instruments with slides like trombones. Then the choir at the west end of the Abbey begins the funeral sentences set by Thomas Morley and heard at previous royal funerals. Morley's sentences are then crowned by Purcell's new setting of Thou Knowest Lord, for which the choir is joined by the flat trumpets. The brass instruments then play Purcell's canzona, and the sequence ends with Morley's I Heard a Voice from Heaven.
And now the choir, having started at the west end of the abbey, is moving up through the great organ screen, out of the nave of the abbey into the choir, moving towards the sanctuary steps. The queen dying before the king, he omitted no ceremony of respect to her memory and remains. The body of the queen was reposed in a mausoleum in form of a bed with black velvet and silver fringe round and hanging in arches. And at the four corners was tapers and in the middle a basin supported by cupids or cherubim's shoulders in which was one entire great lamp burning the whole time.
Music by Henry Purcell and Thomas Morley. The first modern performance of the sequence of music heard at Queen Mary's funeral on the 5th of March, 1695, as researched and edited by Bruce Wood. It was sung by the choir of Westminster Cathedral with the brass players of the New London Consort, directed by Martin Neary. And Thomas Tudway, who witnessed that funeral, later wrote, I appeal to all that were present, as well such as understood music as those that did not, whether they ever heard anything so rapturously fine and solemn and so heavenly in the operation which drew tears from all. Well, ironically, it was only a few months before Purcell himself was dead and his music was heard again here in Westminster Abbey in November 1695. Purcell was the 11th organist at the Abbey since records began in 1559, and Martin Neary is the most recent in a list which includes Orlando Gibbons, John Blow, and William Croft. Westminster Abbey Choir was founded over 600 years ago, and today is made up of professional adult singers, the lay vicars, and boy choristers. The choir's main duties are to sing for daily evensongs, Sunday services and special services, often of national importance, but they also give concerts and make recordings. We end tonight's concert of music for Queen Mary by returning to a mood of celebration. The anthem, O Sing Unto the Lord, is one of Purcell's greatest and dates from 1688, the year of the glorious revolution when Mary came to the throne. Anthems were the musical high point of the Anglican service and when the court band was formed at the Restoration, instrumental music was added to create a new form of great splendour with contrasting solo, instrumental and choral sections. The New London Consort, who are tonight's orchestra, are directed by Philip Pickett. They're well known for their performances of medieval and Renaissance music, but they've also made a speciality of music of the early Baroque and a performance of the opera Psyche by Purcell's predecessor, Matthew Locke, is part of the South Bank Centre's festival, Henry Purcell, the English Genius, which tonight's concert inaugurates. And now here are the soloists for O Singing Unto the Lord, the soprano Emma Kirkby, the alto Michael Chance, the tenor Ian Bostridge, and the basses Stephen Richardson and Simon Birchall. The choir of Westminster Abbey and the New London Consort are conducted again by Martin Neary.
the Lord, sing unto the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song, sing, sing unto the Lord a new song.
Oh, sing unto the Lord, the anthem by Henry Purcell. It was sung by the choir of Westminster Abbey with the new London consort and the soloists Emma Kirkby, Michael Chance, Ian Bostrich, Stephen Richardson and Simon Birchall. And it brings to an end this concert on the 300th anniversary of the funeral of Queen Mary Broadcast live on BBC Two and Radio Three from Westminster Abbey in London as part of the Purcell Tercentenary celebrations and Radio Three's Fairest Isle season in association with the South Bank Centre. And here are the soloists coming back. Emma Kirkby joined by Evelyn Tubb Michael Chance, Ian Bostrich, Stephen Richardson, and Simon Birchall. And here are two boy choristers to present the bouquets. A nice touch. And one certainly feels tonight that Purcell's music sounds as fresh and new as it must have done 300 years ago, and doubtless will do so 300 years hence. I hope you'll be able to join us again later in the year on the anniversary of Purcell's death, the 21st of November, for the climax of the Purcell Tercentenary celebrations. For now, amid the applause from Westminster Abbey, a very good night.